A panorama offers a great breadth of apprehension. The unification of disparate elements gathered together into a coherent view. Yet almost any exhibition of Gerhard Richter's work reveals his so-called consistent inconsistency. And this is all the more so in this huge retrospective upstairs with its generally chronological hang that emphasizes the consistent diversity of the work across the length of Richter's career. That chronology makes clear that Richter never leaves any of his modes of expression behind. They are instead returned to and extended, never made redundant or outgrown. It is, of course, an old art historical convention to understand formal consistency as proof of clarity of insight and resolve in its means of expression. In asking what unites Richter's work, we might reasonably be cautious of too strongly asserting the convention of the oeuvre. Yet there are good reasons that the curators took on this question, not least because Richter him, himself claims a common agenda across his diverse activity. Of course, he said this in a myriad of ways, but perhaps most simply when he says, for me, there's no difference between a landscape and an abstract painting. So while Richter's work refuses a single style, subject, genre, or medium, he insists that there is a consistency in the works themselves beyond the fact of him having made them. Many have looked to Richter's dialogue with photography as a unifying element to the work, and of course some of those uh, scholars are, are here today, and uh, we'll hear later tonight from Kaya Silverman. Um, Richter's work certainly encourages this attention to photography, as does his oft-quoted statement, I'm not trying to imitate a photograph, I'm trying to make one. And if I disregard the assumption that a photograph is a piece of paper exposed to light, then I'm practicing photography by other means. But also, contemporary photographer Thomas Struth has said, I still find it striking that all of Richter's work is related to photography. Imagine his series of grey paintings as sheets of exposed photographic paper, or think of the parallels between his abstractions and Man Ray's experiments. And Dietmar Elger, art historian and director of the Richter Archive, earlier this year commented, Richter's artistic approach has remained the same since 1962. In all his smudges, colour expanse panels, grey paintings, he's been trying to create photographs as defined by him, by painterly means, unquote. Indeed, all aspects of Richter's works can be connected to photography, either technically or conceptually. The Atlas archive of largely photographic images, the photo paintings as based in photographs and having their appearance. The grey paintings and mirror works in their reference to the seamlessness of photography and the middle ground of the grey scale. The colour charts as variously pixelated. The abstract works as photographic blow-ups uh, or landscapes from which photolite fragments are taken to produce later works and the overpaintings, where paint and snapshot collide. And of course, already today, we've heard of, uh, about e each category of image in these terms. I could go on in, with these associations to photography, and it's not at all insignificant that so many correspondences can be made. However, the connection between Richter and photography, I think, also risks becoming a commonplace that too easily over overlooks the specificity of his conceptions of the medium and its effects one that also reduces photography to a simple category. As intimated by Elgar, a different and broader conception of what I call the photographic opens out from Richter's creating photographs as defined by him. Some of the significance of Richter's success lies in what he tells us about photography, so often termed the pre-eminent visual form of our times. But Richter's insight does not so much concern this pre-eminence but rather the model of, that photography offers of art's pursuit of a certain truth, however naive this might sound. Richter has said, when I look out the window, then what I see outside is true for me in its various tones, colours and proportions. It is a truth and it has its own rightness. This is a constant demand on me and it is a model for my pictures, unquote. I argue that we should understand this truth and rightness as photographic, but importantly, not in the terms of the veracity of photographic appearances. On the contrary, I think that what unites Richter's work is quite outside concepts of representation. 
While the photographic representation is at stake in photo paintings, this lies over a broader concept of semblance by, Richter, by which Richter understands all his paintings, paintings that are also kinds of photographs as understood by him. So I'm attempting to identify a broader conception of the photographic that is doggedly pursued by Richter and is able to exist outside photography. And I've previously discussed this relation to the role of idiom in art mediums. But today I want to emphasise another aspect of this relation and argue that Richter's engagement with photography makes clear what's always been the essential but enigmatic <coughs> condition within painting. That in searching for a direct connection with a singular experience of the world, painting has always been in pursuit of something that we now think of as photographic. And I want to test this idea in what might seem its least likely location, Richter's recent hinterglass mallory or behind glass paintings, found in series such as Sinbad from 2008 and Aladdin from 2010. And I'll work towards these examples by way of the photo paintings and over paintings in order to make my argument with perhaps uh, more familiar sorts of examples. Early in his career, Richter stated, a painted murder is completely devoid of interest. A photograph one shocks everybody. We must introduce something like this in painting." Unquote. We might read Richter's photo paintings, their photographic origins and appearance, and sometimes even their grisly subjects, as a direct attempt to do just this. However, this statement is equally applicable to Richter's broader practice and ambitions. Over the 50 years since that statement, Richter has sought the immediacy of effect the visceral shock of the truth of the photograph, though that quality is never achieved through the same straightforward means as the photographic document, even when that seems to be what's on offer, as in works such as Tolt or Tourists with Lines or indeed the October series paintings. Truth in art has meant many things. Truth to appearance, to a, a medium or a discipline, and Richter can be said to have addressed the dangers and disappointments of each of these. However, the overarching truth to which he's been committed is outside what is recognisable and instead insistently grounded in effect. Nicholas Sirota asks Richter, do you think painting is about discovering the unknown or the known? Richter replies, the known, which we see and experience, which affects us and we have to react to. Actually, this is the most important thing. And as long as we don't understand that and are able to and are unable to deal with it, it turns into the unknown, into what it was. This has an excitement all of its own." Unquote. Richter's work shows us that painted semblances, seeming to be what is known and recognisable, <coughs> are not attempts to adduce the feelings that we have in lived life, but rather to isolate new unknown effects proper to art. I've argued that Richter's photo paintings open up our understanding of these issues through their use of the blurring that's characteristic of photographic errors. Properly speaking, that blurring shows nothing. It represents nothing, less even than a blurred photograph. Yet at the same time, that painted blur is also paint. It generates a play between the actuality of the visible and what cannot be shown through a type of shock or surprise of apprehension. In this way, the works exceed the signifying power of images based in conventional mimetic structures, even as they refer to photography, the image form that is most bound to those structures. Art historian Georges Didi Ubermann describes this kind of relationship in terms of the power of dissemblance over resemblance. Didi Ubermann's account of dissemblance, which he uses to explain the curiously abstract blotches of paint in Fra Angelico's frescoes, enables the blur to be understood within a visual economy more nuanced than traditional art historical dichotomy of figuration versus abstraction. Didi Uberman writes, these moments in the painting where the visible vacillates and spills into the visual, the cursed parts of painting, the indexical, non-descriptive and dissemblant part, paintings often reserve, and this is once more their gift for disconcerting, a part of themselves for negating or clouding what they affirm in the mimetic order. Something of their aspect collapses at that point and dissemblance, a sort of disturbance, comes to reign here." Unquote. 
This gift for disconcerting is central to Richter's concept for painting. The blur of the photo paintings is just one instance of this, connecting us to the mimetic order at the same time that it takes us away from it. The blur makes the most direct type of meaning through this dissemblance, this disruption of appearance, resemblance and recognition. Across Richter's work, we see various mechanisms for opening to this strangeness, as Didi Uberman terms it. Blurs, but also blotches, globs of paint at reflection and glare and so on. These motifs are doubly disturbing. At one level, they represent the empirical difficulties of seeing, but in retaining their own materiality, they represent nothing and refuse to cohere or to make a picture. Richter's photographic effect relies on both these states, but in their purest form. Paint as means of representing and as nothing but its material self. These disturbances are a means towards an inimitable immediacy, uh, an immediacy of experience located outside what is recognisable, that is, outside what is already known. Richter recently said, appearance, semblance, is the theme of my life, unquote. And we can understand his art in his response to this semblance, in the dissemblance of his works that open to the world as unfathomable appearance, while connecting us back to our experience of it in the sureness of a sharp shock. In the overpaintings, Richter brings painting and photography into direct confrontation. In these small works, snapshot photographs are overpainted with thick paint applied using the same dragging technique as used in many of his abstracts. The paint, we're told, is in fact the residue of those abstracts, paint literally taken from the squeegee, its colours and their combination the result of that other painting process. While the process of the overpaintings is easily understood and self-evident, they're strangely confounding in their effect. Richter violently inserts abstraction as a schema and as a fact into the mimetic order of the photograph. Photography slips away into a substanceless nothingness. As Richter says, the photograph has almost no reality. This is underlined by the seamlessness of its surface, its paper thinness, whereas painting is emphatically present made all the more tangible in its substance as paint by the slickness of its support in the surface of the snapshot. These works reverse conventional understandings of the proximity to reality of painting and photography. Here reality, the material of paint, is contrasted with the relative insubstantiality of the photograph, its lack of physical presence. Photo lab hues pale in comparison to the vividness of artists' paints. The physical weight of paint meets and overcomes the weight of photography's verisimilitude. It's no coincidence that this disruption is formless, assiduously non-figurative painting, that is, a type of blur. The relationship played out in these works is the perfect parallel to the one that Didi Uberman describes as enabling Angelico's fresco to arrive at the inevitable. That is, it is the dissemblant, a signifying smeared paint against the figurative clarity of the photograph of ground, as ground that opens the work to meaning in a way that neither means of expression could achieve alone. As Elga writes, Richter succeeds in making them not only question one another, but also mutually assume their respective qualities." Unquote. The overpaintings enact a twofold invisibility. Photography is transformed into the physical support of painting and occluded made invisible in the process. Painting, through its own abstraction, made all the more so by the graphic promise glimpsed in its photographic ground, shows us nothing other than itself, make no makes nothing visible. Yet this twofold invisibility can also be said to produce a double reality, that of the photograph's verisimilitude and that of the smeared blur of paint on its in its confronting actuality. Both are idiomatic of their medium, and maintain the differential specificity of painting and photography, even as they make the one image where the visible spills into the visual. Richter says, What fascinates me is the alogical, unreal, atemporal, meaningless occurring of an occurrence which is simultaneously so logical, so real, so temporal and so human, and for that reason so compelling. And I would like to represent it in such a way that this clash is maintained." Unquote. The, the overpaintings are that clash. In their links to the abstract paintings and the impression that the snapshot image might be completely overcome by paint, we can also think of them as being the model of all Richter's works. That is, 
The photograph is emblematic of the ground behind all the works, including the large abstracts. The accumulation and layering of the abstracts paint is built up against and on top of that idea of the world as knowable because it is visible. Richter has painted on glass at regular intervals, and here we can think of many of his grey paintings, works like Black, Red, Gold from 1999, the glass pane works, such as Double Pane of Glass from 1977. But in series such as Sinbad and Aladdin, behind glass paintings, as they're termed, we see something different again. At the same time, these paintings draw together aspects of what I've been describing in the other works and in Richter's pursuit of photographic effect. These disarmingly simple works suggest the contingency and ease of production of a snapshot, at the same time that they claim the aesthetic immediacy of abstract art. I say this for a number of reasons, not least of which relates to the process of their making, which is similar to that of a transfer print, but to say so tends to disguise how curious this is in painting. Richter applies quantities of unmixed paint to a large prepared surface. The colours might sit side by side or flow into each other. He intervenes in these relationships, working the paint further with a spatula or brush. Richter then takes a sheet of glass and places it directly on top of the paint, applying pressure until the paint is transferred uniformly onto that glass. This is the painting behind glass, a perfect impression of the paint, a print, a direct trace, as accurate and direct as a photograph, in fact more direct, more accurate, for being the very thing itself rather than its representation. Not copy, nor imitation, nor illusion of what it shows, but a perfect double that exceeds its origin in becoming permanent and sealed on and behind glass. Richter's made a great many of these glass paintings in recent years. The Sinbad series alone includes 100 works. In exhibition and publication, he often arranges them in pairs as if pages of a book or the folded paper of an ink blot. Yet in these pairings, there can be no repetition and reversal through impression. There is no equivalence. The original has been made and lost in the process of its making. They are singular and inimitable. Like so many of Richter's works, the glass paintings connect us to the history of painting. Glass painting has a mixed heritage. We find it in Duchamp's large glass, but also in amateur practice and training in painting, where glass is used so that the work can be wiped away and begun again, using glass to save a canvas, if you like. But we can equally associate this process with photography. Richter's taking of the image is not tentative nor reversible, but emphatic and mechanical, fixing it onto glass for keeping. There is also the material correspondence between the glass and the seamless photograph, that slick support that shows the painting's colour without the deflecting tooth of canvas to dissipate that intensity. Aside from the photo-like appearance of the glass paintings and the associations that we can find in their production, the works have the photographic effect that I've been at pains to identify. Didi Uberman again helps articulate this connection when he describes the gaudily painted faux marble panels that are part of Angelico's holy conversation. These panels, called Mami Finti, or fictive marble, are generally overlooked as, simple, as simply decorative. Didi Uberman says of them, Angelico's surface is more likely to evoke one of Jackson Pollock's drippings than any construction of the Italian Renaissance. This gaudily coloured surface does not really represent fictive marble, but rather presents itself for what it is in all rigour on this wall, pure and non-fictive paint." Unquote. The intense floating colour and blotch form of Richter's glass paintings are, like Marmi Finti, ambivalent. They appear to be abstract art, but at the same time to be natural phenomena like the figures waiting to be discovered by stonecutters working marble. Although they might draw these associations to our mind, just as Angelico's ostensible subject as marble and the architectural framing of his fresco, Richter's means of effect and his subject are the same, pure paint. This is paint that is not fictive nor illusional and yet figured, a pure capacity for truth in semblance, as mundane and as irreducible as the verisimilitude of a photograph. 
Richter's paintings tell us something about the photographic that is not particular to a technology or medium. The veracity of the photographic is something more than the verisimilitude of photographs. Retrospectively, we might choose to understand aspects of painting by Angelico and Pollock as photographic, and we can do so because of what Richter does and says about his painting. For Richter to claim that he is making photographs suggests that we consider that painting has always played its role of semblance against an apprehension of the visual as a pure state. Richter shows us a concept of the photographic anterior to photography, a concept of immediacy that is not a representation of lived life, but proper to the experience of art. It is through this that Richter shows how painting might give, as he says, a more modern truth, one that we are already living out in our lives. Life is not what is said, but the saying of it, not the picture, but the picturing." Unquote. Thank you very much.